Good evening, it is, or morning, excuse me, I'm sorry. It has been a busy weekend, but it is good to see you this morning, and I hope that you have had a good weekend thus far and are anxious to start a new week today as we began the first day of the week with an opportunity to worship and praise our God. And our, our message this morning, let every heart rejoice and sing. In 1842, a young man, 29 years of age, his name was Henry S. Washburn, penned the words that we often sing. You know them, you've sung them. Let every heart rejoice and sing, let choral anthems rise. Ye aged men and children bring to God your sacrifice. Then there's the chorus. Why? For He is good. The Lord is good and kind are all His ways. With songs and honors sounding loud, the Lord Jehovah prays. While the rocks and the rills, while the vales and the hills, a glorious anthem raise, let each prolong their grateful song, the God of our fathers praise, and the God of our fathers praise. As Christians, you and I have a host of reasons to praise God this morning. We have a host of reasons to praise God each day that we live. But do we stop and think about those things? The text that was read for us just a moment ago is actually a hymn of praise by a young mother-to-be. Some have even speculated she might have been as young as 15 or 16 years of age when she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And this hymn is known as the Magnificat. It is taken from the first word of that hymn in the Latin translation. That's what it's known as. And in this hymn, what Mary does is she offers praise to the Lord for what God has done following what we might call Elizabeth's blessing upon her that you find there in verses 42 through 45. And yet, Mary's praise is not superficial. It's not just words spoken to be spoken. If you'll notice the very first lines, it comes from her soul. It comes from deep within, from her spirit. And it's not like those of Jesus' day that he condemned in the Sermon on the Mount because as he said, there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they might be seen by men. No, this is different. There is no audience except for maybe Elizabeth. Mary's words are words to God. She can teach us something this morning. As we examine the words that she speaks in these few verses, and as we look at this hymn more closely, I'd like for us to learn two things this morning that Mary knew in her heart of hearts. Number one is this. There is someone that is worthy, worthy of our praise. You've been singing to him this morning. Mary tells us who he is. Number two, there's a reason, maybe I should say several reasons, that he is worthy of that praise. And she also identifies those reasons. We could add to them, but we're just going to look at what Mary gives us this morning. So let's begin by looking at who is it that Mary's praising. Notice what she says. She says, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. 700 years before Mary ever speaks these words, a prophet by the name of Malachi, I mean uh, Isaiah, says... Speaking on God's behalf, twice, first of all in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 26, and then in chapter 60, verse 16, God says through His prophet, I, the Lord, am your Savior. God calls Himself our Savior. Stop and think about that. And it was in this Savior that Mary is now taking the time to rejoice, singing His praise. Those of us this morning who are Christians, we do the same. We sing His praise because as the Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege Timothy, some words so long ago, God has saved us 
and called us with a holy calling. Paul over in Philippians 3 tells us that that holy calling is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, what God is doing is God is calling each of us who are Christians heavenward. That's the upward call. And that upward call of God is being given to us, extended to us through His Son, Jesus Christ, because of what He has done on the cross for us so long ago. Why does God make that call to us? It's because of something else that Paul says in another letter that he also wrote. It's found over in 1 Timothy chapter 2. You see, it is God's desire that we pray, he says, for all of those who are in authority. And then he says in verse 3, this is good and acceptable in sight of God, our Savior. And he tells us why. He says he desires all men all people, everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God is our Savior. He sent His Son to die on the cross so that we might be among the redeemed, that we might be saved. And the thing that He, that caused this, that prompted this is His kindness, His love, His mercy. Over in His letter to Titus, Titus chapter 3, He talks about the, when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis, He says, of deeds which we have done in righteousness. But then he says, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out richly upon us through Christ our Savior. This morning, when we sing our praise, we are singing that praise, we are rejoicing in the one who is our Savior. It's God. But Mary called him something else. Not only does she call him our Savior, she also refers to him as the Mighty One. The way she puts it is this, down in verse 49. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. She refers to him as the Mighty One, and then she tells why he's the Mighty One. Because he has done great things for me. As a matter of fact, if you go back to a few verses up, you find that Mary questioned how she could ever be with child because she was a virgin. She had never known a man. And the angel Gabriel who had been sent to bring her this message explained to her that her cousin Elizabeth, who had been barren, had been actually sterile, was with child and in the sixth month of her pregnancy and that God could bring this about. And then he, he makes the statement for nothing will be impossible with God. God is the mighty one, folks, because nothing is impossible with Him. Especially when it comes to our salvation. Nothing is impossible with God. Why? Go back to Genesis 1.1 and what do you read? In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Nothing is impossible with Him. He spoke it into existence. Many of us struggle just to make things sometimes with our own hands. And yet God's spoken into existence. David over in Psalm 24 verse 8 asked the question, Who is the king of glory? And then he says, The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He says that's who God is. He's the king of glory. Or in another psalm, Psalm 71 verse 19, we find there that God is someone of whom there is no one else like him. As a matter of fact, here's what the psalmist says. He says, For your righteousness, O God, reaches the heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? And the answer is, there's no one like our God. He is the mighty one. And just as His mighty power accomplished great things for His people in days of old, it is no different for us today. You, you examine the Scriptures, what Kyle talked about earlier in our Bible class about the Bereans. They examined the Scriptures that, and to determine whether or not the things that Paul was saying were true. When you examine the Scriptures, you find just who our God is. What is the Gospel? Paul said it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. In the gospel, there is God's power to save us. Or, give you another one, our faith. 
Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says that our faith does not rest upon the wisdom of men, but he says upon the power of God. Or something else Paul says in that epistle to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there in verse 14, he tells us that just as God raised His Son from the dead, so He will also raise us up through His power. The same power Paul says that God used to raise His Son from the dead is the power that He will use to raise us up from the dead. Why? Because God is the Mighty One. God's power, Paul was told over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, is perfected even in our weakness. God's power is at work. And God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Well, what is that power? It's the power of God at work within us to accomplish God's purposes. Peter makes this statement over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. He tells us that you and I are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. God is protecting you through His power by faith for that salvation that is going to be revealed to you at that last day. Why? Because He's the Mighty One. So when you, you sing praise, when we rejoice in God our Savior, we realize He's not just our Savior, He is the Mighty One who has done all of these great things for us. That's what makes Him the Mighty One, the power He has to bring about His will, and nothing can thwart that, nothing can prevent that. But there's one other thing that Mary says about Him. In that same verse, verse 49, she says, holy is his name. He is the one whose name is holy. Oh, we hear that so often, the idea, the concept of holy, but what does it mean to be holy? It means that someone or something is set apart from common use for something that is special. God is holy. To be holy is to be like God. You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You may remember in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah's vision of the Lord seated upon His throne in the heavenly temple. And the angels, the seraphim, are flying about Him, attending to Him. And they cry out these words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. You see, that's the God you and I serve. That is the God who has redeemed us, who has called us to be His own. The psalmist used that term frequently. 99, Psalm 99, verse 3, Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is He. Or Psalm 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Or Psalm 111, verse 9, he has sent redemption to His people. He has ordained the covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. And then there are the songs that we sing. Know this one. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, my song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. God over all and blessed eternally. Many of you who are old, are, are, Older will remember a different ending. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. That's the God that we serve. And then there's another one that was just written a few years ago, 2011. Our young people love this song. You ought to come to camp and just hear them sing it one time. 10,000 reasons. Or go to PTP or go to CYC or you'll have to ask Kyle what all those initials mean. But these places, they love to sing the song, and it is beautiful. But listen to the chorus. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. 
I'll worship your holy name. Folks, that's God. And when Mary is declaring her praise, when she says, my soul, my spirit rejoices in him, this is who she's talking about. God, my Savior, the mighty one who has done great things for me, the one whose name is holy. But the question is, why do we and why did Mary rejoice in him? There are at least four reasons that I can pull out of what we've read or had read for us this morning. And the first of those is this. It is that God exalts those who humble themselves. He exalts the humble. She puts it this way in two different places in our reading this morning. First of all, verse 48, she says, He has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. And then later down in verse 52, He, that is God, has exalted those who were humble. Many years before, over a thousand years before she would speak these words, David had written in Psalm 138, verse 6, these words, For though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly. You may remember there was an occasion over in Luke chapter 14 where Jesus has been invited to the house of a Pharisee. It's not Simon. I don't think it's a, a different Pharisee. And he has been watching as people have been coming in and taking their places around the table. They're looking for the prominent seats, the places that are important. And I want you to listen to what he says to them after he's been paying attention to all this. It begins in verse 8 of chapter 14 there in Luke's Gospel. He says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in this grace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. James said that God is opposed to the proud, but that he gives grace to the humble. That's found in James chapter 4, verse 6. Well, if you look four verses after that, down in James chapter 4, verse 10, there's something else he says. He tells us what to do. He says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. That's what we do. God exalts the humble, but before God can exalt the humble, we have to humble ourselves. How do we humble ourselves? What does that look like? when you put flesh on that concept. Paul describes it over in Philippians chapter 2. Here's the way he puts it, if you'll notice there, verses 3 and 4. He says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And then he adds, Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. We've all seen those people who are interested only in their own personal interest. Get out of my way. I want that. You're blocking me. Move over. Oh, that's my spot. Get out of my seat. Have you ever been somewhere to worship and somebody has come up to you and said, you're visiting. You're a visitor. You don't know the congregation. You've never been there before. You sit down in a seat and somebody says, you're in my seat. And they wait on you to move. We're talking about Christians doing this. Folks, I was invited to speak somewhere years ago. I've only been there one time. I asked when I got there to speak in the Bible class. I said, will I be in somebody's seat if I sit second row back, where, kind of where my wife and I are sitting? They said, no, 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 no. You won't be in anybody's spot. So I, I taught the class. My wife had gone to the Bible class with a friend of ours, a, a lady that she is very close friends with. I sat down there after the services were over, or after the Bible class was over, and I'm sitting there, and a gentleman walks up and looks at me and says, you're in my seat. 
I'm the visiting preacher that morning. You're in my seat. And he stood there until I moved. Folks, if I hadn't been the visiting preacher, I don't know that I'd ever gone back to that congregation. I might have walked out right then and said, if that's the way people treat me in the house of God, you know, in, in, in God's fellowship, in the church, it's not where I need to be. I need to be somewhere where people, oh, hey, great seat. You can hear real well right there. And I'd go find another seat. You see, that's what it means to humble ourselves. Here, you go before me. Let me do this before you. Let me help you with that. Let me open the door for you. Let me, you see, that's what it means to humble ourselves before God. God exalts us. God will be the one that exalts. We just do what we need to do. Another thing that we find Mary saying is the reason for rejoicing in God is what we just mentioned a moment ago, the mighty one. Why? Because he has done great things for me. God does great things for his people. For Mary, the great things were that he recognized her, her humble estate, and that he gave her the privilege of bringing into this world the Savior of mankind, of being the bearer of that child. For a man known as Legion, on the shores of Galilee, the great thing that Jesus did for him was to remove from him a number of demons, casting them into swine, so that that man was once again whole and in his right mind. And even though he wanted to get into the boat and go with Jesus, wherever Jesus was going, Jesus said to him, as Mark records it for us over in Mark chapter 5, verse 19, he says, go home to your people. Report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how He has had mercy on you. Well, folks, God didn't just do great things back then. He still does great things today for us. For example, do you realize that He has redeemed us through Christ's blood? He has granted unto us who are here this morning as Christians the forgiveness of our sins. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, I want you to know that He has sent His Son to redeem you and to take away your sins if you will but come to Him in obedient faith. He has adopted us into His family according to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He has reserved for us in heaven an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and it will not fade away. That's what Peter tells us. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And you know, He has promised that He will never leave us, that He will never forsake us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Do you realize all the great things that God has done for you to this, just to this point in time? Do you realize those things? Do you take the time to praise God for that? Thank you for all that you've done for me. For all that you've done. I, our young people sing, for all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do, I will thank you. You see, that's what we do. Mary says there's another reason that we praise Him, that we rejoice in Him. It is that He is merciful toward those who fear Him. She put it this way. There in verse 50, His mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear Him. This past Tuesday evening, in our gospel meeting, Steve Baggett told us that mercy is not getting what we deserve. And then he explained. You see, because of our sin, we deserve from God condemnation and eternal punishment. That's what we deserved. But God, because of His mercy, did not do that. He exercised that mercy. He pardoned us of our sins so that we do not get, if we're Christians, we do not get what we deserve. We deserve condemnation. We deserve punishment. Aren't you thankful that God says, no, I've taken that away. And as he pointed out in another sermon, Paul 
acknowledged that even though he was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, God showed him mercy. God showed him mercy because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul told Titus that God did not save us, and we've already looked at this over in Titus chapter 3, God did not save us because of deeds which we have done in righteousness. No, there was not a deed we could do that would deserve our salvation, that would deserve for God to say to us, you're a good person, come on in. No. God saved us according to His mercy. And aren't you thankful for that mercy? We sing praise to Him because of that. As a matter of fact, Peter praised God for that abundant mercy over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are blessed people because of God's mercy. And yet this great mercy, as Mary says, is only extended toward those who fear Him, who reverence Him, who submit to Him in obedient faith. My question for you this morning is, have you been the recipient of God's mercy in your life? And if so, do you rejoice in Him? Mary gives us one more. It is because God is the giver of all good things. Or as she puts it there in verse 53, He has filled the hungry with good things. I think she's pulling that directly from one of the Psalms. Psalms 107 verse 9. Because there the psalmist says... God has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with good. You know this one. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, is the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for you, O God. And then in verse 2, it says, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. My question for you this morning is, does your soul thirst for God? Do you long for him? Do you want him in your life? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, For they shall be filled. And later in that Sermon on the Mount over in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said something else. He says, What man is there if his son asked for a loaf would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? I don't think there's a man in this room that if his son was hungry and said, Dad, I'm hungry, would you give me something? Oh, here's a stone, take it and chew on it for a while. No, fathers don't do that. Fathers sacrifice for their sons and their daughters. They provide. That's what a father does. And Jesus said... If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good to those who ask of Him? And then he adds this. Every, well, I shouldn't say he adds this. James adds this. Every good thing given, every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. You see, God gives good to those who fear Him to those who seek Him, to those who love Him. The question is, have you been a recipient of God's goodness? If you have, praise Him. Praise Him for what He's done in your life. Mary spoke a hymn which is so far beyond what so many people tend to stop and think about today. A young person educating us about who God is and why He's worthy of our praise. God is our Savior. God is the mighty one who gives us good things. God is the one whose name is holy. God is the one, she would tell us, who is worthy of our praise because who he, he exalts the humble. He is worthy of our praise because He has done and continues to do great things for us. He is worthy of our praise because 
His great mercy has brought our salvation and continues to do more than that for us. He is worthy of our praise because He has filled us with good things. And He does good for those who love Him. Are you a person whose life is seen to be a life filled with praise for the God you serve? Are you grateful for the the good that you see on a daily basis around you? Are you a person who's always looking for what's wrong? Oh, there's plenty to look at that's wrong in this world. I, I, I understand. I wasn't born yesterday. I see the wrong all around me. But I also know there's a great God that I serve who has redeemed me, who has promised eternal life to me, who continues even in the turmoil of life that we encounter on a daily basis to say, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I am with you all the days of your life even to the end of the age. Do you have a God like that that you serve right now? A God that you're praising? If you're here this morning and you're not doing that, your your life has not been given to Him in obedient faith, you don't know what you're missing out on right now, what you just don't have available to you. My plea to you, our plea to you, those of us who are Christians here this morning want you to know the God that we know, to serve the God that we serve, to come to Him in obedient faith, to be willing to confess His Son Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to be buried with Him in baptism because you've repented of your sins and you've turned to Him so that His blood through that baptism can wash away those sins. If you need to respond to our Lord's invitation, won't you please come right now as together we stand and sing.